Kira Koto, ko Sonia Bailey Toko Ingwa, uh, here Tumaki tum Torua. Uh, um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm the DP at, here at Christchurch Girls. Kia ora whanau, uh, ko Christine O'Neill Toko Inua Ingwa Fano. I'm the Tumaki here at um, Takura Hine Wai Ora and previously Tumaki at Hato. And I'll have to say nice things about Hamish or he's going to heckle me otherwise <laughs> in the back of the room. Uh, kia ora whanau. Uh, ko Vicky Teasdale to put Ingawa. So I um, am the literacy coordinator at uh, CGHS, a, recently, um, a role that we've recently created within the school um, in response to the co requisite, which I'm happy to talk about, but I'm also um, assistant holder English with responsibility for junior English. Kia ora tātou, um, <coughs> ko Jeremy Brocklehurst, tō ingoa, um, and yeah, I'm head of uh, junior maths at Christchurch Skills High School. So um, we've been, yeah, we've been doing that whole co-papa around ending streaming. Um, I actually started teaching at the school at the same time as it started, which was the beginning of last year. Um, and yeah, it's been it's been an exciting journey to be part of, and um, yeah, it's still very much a work in progress. Um, so we'll talk more about it in a wee bit. But yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay. So if we think sort of like kind of why, how, what, let's start with why. Um, Christine, do you want to go first in terms of what, what's the big why here? And how does it fit within the other, you know, put up said about transformational change. I think that's your context too, isn't it? There's a bit going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the, the core of the why is the values that school developed as part of a bigger process. And they are Whanangatanga, Manakitanga, Araha and Rangateratanga. So just sort of going back a bit, when I arrived in July 2019, I'd had 10, 10 years as principal at Haro Tamati, and that school had changed from pretty monocultural through to about 50% Māori and Pacifica, changed from punitive to restorative, massive curriculum change led, you know, uh, Hamish was a huge leader of that. So when I arrived here, I arrived as a Every school's different, and the answers are different, and the whys are different, but you certainly have some strategies in your toolbox around how to create an environment that people in an organisation can develop their core beliefs and who they are, which will provide the why for a whole lot of things. So the first, to, to get to the why, the first we spent the first six months doing a massive reset around the vision for what this school was about and what it would look like in the future. And you know, it's 145 years old, it's one of those city named schools, a huge tradition, but actually it was formed out of counterculturalism. So it was formed out of women wanting access to education when they had no access to education. So a disempowered position to develop empowerment for women around education. So the tradition of the school was actually in challenge to the status quo. And so it was big conversations around, have we actually come away from what our foundation was? We're now all about tradition, which isn't necessarily bad. There's lots of value in that. We're about academic results. What else are we about? And what are, what are we doing about challenging status quo and inequity and all those things? So. There was actually a massive conversation around our identity <coughs> as a school. Are we going to be a privileged little enclave as Girls High, churning out very successful students who go on to have very successful lives, but their lives are about empowering themselves? Or are we, are we about um, educating our young people to critique society and critique the power structures? And if that's what we're going to do, what are we going to do about it? And what's our behaviours and our decisions going to look like? And if we're going to, so part of that process was developing a vision and values, and then the conversation around values driven decision making for the whole school. And if we're going to have those values, are there other things we can carry on doing and be authentic <coughs> to our values? So we spent a long time on that, um, on that process with a lot of um, uh, engagement with our community, <coughs> our staff, our students, our Fano group, our Pacifica group, um, we actually have quite a significant Muslim group. Um, so there's a huge amount of consultation and then beyond that, before we even get to streaming, beyond that, um, and Sonia 
and Vicky and um, Jeremy can talk more about it. The development of foundation documents alongside that. So a junior growth profile, a graduate profile, a teacher profile. So if we've got these values, if we've got this vision, what do we want our young people to be? What's their education about? Um, well, how do we want them to leave here? And if we want our young people to be like that, what do we need our teachers to be like? And at the same time, it was like a perfect storm because at the same time, the rebuild in the school had turned custard, really political, uh, picked up the education brief and looked at it. It doesn't have any reference to treaty partnerships or cultural responsiveness. So we decided we'd start again. So at the same time, we were writing an education brief which was about what does the future of education in this school look like? So we had the opportunity to be working on big foundation documents and getting buy-in from everybody about that through a lot of iterative consultation processes. And actually, out of those whys, out of our values and our purposes around cultural responsiveness, treaty partnership, innovation, engagement, and critical reflection on ourselves as an organisation and transformational leadership. We believe <laughs> you cannot have that sitting there and continue streaming. And actually what happened at the end was I've been pumping out our RRO, um, colouring in the white spaces, all those documents, a lot of conversations about our identity. We went to a whole meeting in November in 2020 wasn't even on the agenda and I put out our row about two weeks beforehand and the holders brought it up, don't forget this has been a very traditional school, and said this, this document is, you know, it tells us streaming is unjust, it's inequitable for our Māori students in society and in the school and for other students. They agreed and they said but if we know this now at this meeting, we have to stop now. And I was like, oh my god it's November, so that means that at February intake we're going to do this but we're not stopping this, we're going to capitalise on this and that's what happened in, a, in 20 minutes basically but there's a whole backstory behind that. Does that answer your question? I'm yeah, trying yeah. to encapsulate a whole lot in the very well, you, you certainly had a tipping point then didn't you? Yeah. And let's, oh, let's, hold that, let's hold that thought for a minute, yeah. why don't we go back a wee bit yeah. and then we'll go forward to that. Yeah. Um, so all those things that were the perfect storm, the identity mm. crisis and the new identity and all that kind of mm. thing, lots of curriculum mm -hmm. shaping mm -hmm. that's ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, Sonia, do you want to talk about the profiles? That sounds really cool. How does the teacher and student profile fit with the Yeah, so vision? I flipped up the junior growth profile, which is actually the first one we actually wrote. And when it came out, so this was based on a huge amount of voice that came from our parents, our students, um, uh, and our teachers as well around what do they actually want the students to look like? And when you actually broke it down, Actually, the academics was only a small part of it. It was actually, and that's what uh, Christine was saying, it's actually about how are we uh, educating the whole person. Um, so that was a real shift for us when we created this and how we've actually um, moved forward from our thinking because previously it all just been results-based. Um, so there is also a teacher profile, which I could bring up, of the, that's very similar. They're all for, um, and we've just recently finished off our graduate profile. So this growth profile we felt for the end of year 10, which sits very much within our junior school and how does that lead on to our, when we actually, we've done, they leave here. So these were based on a whole lot of voice, but that was a, yeah, a big chunk of work that just came down to the actually, academics is only a small part. It's actually the rest of it is what we want our students to be. And it goes in and sits alongside that, that um, Streaming wasn't part of the, the conversation around how does it actually work if we want our students to look like this, actually we need to take that away. So that was probably um, one of the, yeah. the key drivers behind it. Um, then on our curriculum thing too, so we've been working a whole lot on our junior curriculum and trying to take us away from just being very academic driven. We used to have, um, it's probably from when I start, We've started NCA at year nine. Um, I think that's a thing that's been over the last 20 years. Some of the courses would not start year NCA, but some of the courses were how do we actually get our girls to succeed? So we'll start teaching you NCA content from when you start here. So we've actually been moved away from that a lot, and this has helped driven it. Um, and we're actually, for the first time, we're actually bringing in some courses that are actually much more culturally responsive um, next year for our year nines, uh, much more. Um, authentic in the fact that students can see themselves in it and we're actually getting some really good feedback from our community at the moment. We've got um, 
their young people starting next year to say actually now we've got some courses that they're actually excited about they're not uh, and it's not just all about the results so there's been a real shift in our pedagogical thinking and um, what we're offering we've still got our subjects but we've got some new things coming in next year which is really exciting yeah and the, I'll just read these out uh, junior growth profile I, I own my learning I'm proud of who I am I make a difference in my community I care for others and I'm open to new ideas which is pretty cool okay so there's a, all this stuff happening mm -hmm. and then you have this Hollows meeting, and you kind of got a surprise, Christine. And, <laughs> and normally, you know, change management, you sort of, the, you know, the, the best practice there is take your time, get everyone on board, plan it out. You know, Kyle was saying, you know, or was it Pitipi was saying, you mm -hmm. know, like work slowly. You guys broke all those rules. You just got rid of it, did you? Yeah, but it had those things had happened, but it, it was a different process that happened in advance, and so the removal of streaming wasn't something that we did in isolation as yep. removal of streaming, it was an outcome of yep. a values driven process where we can't say we're going to honour these values and do this. Um, yep. And so because the pre-work had been done with community and whatever, what we did was Sonia put together a um, newsletter for the parents with a whole lot of research in it, we sent it out to them. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to get 100 emails in my inbox now from this community. Although the voice of our parents, mm. our students, um, and our staff, and all our different groups have been telling us differently, I still thought, you know, because I know some other schools have done it and just had an avalanche of things. I got one email through the whole process from a parent who wasn't against it but wanted to know how we would extend. That was it. it was and then we stopped streaming in the January of that year, so now now our juniors are fully de-streamed. Mm. As you say, there's a whole lot of other things to look at as well. Mm. Yeah. So that, um, Christine, you wrote a pretty magic, new, mm. um, no, sorry, Sonia, you wrote a magic uh, Pānui that obviously met the needs of the parents in terms of their questions. And I thought, yeah, I, I'm, I'm one of those people who I, if you know me, I like a lot of research and I like to dot my eyes and cross my T's as well. So I know as a parent what I would like to see because I, if I want to delve in and actually know what it is, so everyone says the research is out, research is out there, but if you just saying that without actually providing the links, you know, even down to quotes from Chris Hipkins himself, the education minister, um, the stuff from uh, Parapu, you or oh, the work that you've done, those links went out to our community. Uh, John Hattie's work around um, streaming not work. I have found some research articles as well. Um, out of Waikato uh, University. So all of these I provided little links that went out mm. so people could actually dip in, dip out. I think there were some little um, YouTube clips. Dip in, dip out. So therefore, if you're a parent and you want to know, and it was very hard to come back when you've got all of these different things um, that was accessible to go, well, <laughs> well, that's what I think, Well, because we didn't get the, the pushback to say, well, mm. carry on. Mm. And I suppose, um, because we were also, there was a bit of a swirl in our, much our teachers, um, which um, Christine alluded to, when we started actually amongst ourselves sending these articles around and the discussion at our learning and teaching, which is our whole of, um, our head of science says, how can we, this is where the conversation started, how can we carry on doing this because a lot of these things said that it's a really racist thing to do and how can we carry on if this is a racist thing because I, this is not something that I, and it was a real light bulb moment for them. And then you actually you talk to your head of languages, your commerce teachers, your um, the, your languages, etc. They all say, well, we actually don't stream anyway because actually we just get mixed ability. So it really only came down to maths and English. Uh, where the two sticking points, social science, they said we don't, it doesn't bother us. So actually when you unpacked it with them, it was actually came down to maths and English and um, English very open, maths I think you guys was before Jeremy's time, they did have some robust discussion. <laughs> they were apprehensive. They were apprehensive. <laughs> Not against it, but apprehensive. And I, and I know that and in the end, I know our head of maths, she's amazing, she just said well actually there are some times we're just going to have to do, the rest of the school's going this, we got on our journey. Um, and I got them to brainstorm as well from English and maths point of view. So what are the things that you're going to do and commit to for our students to help those to extend themselves and how to, um, to make sure that those at the other end are supported in their learning? And that actually was part of the um, panoe that it went out to the parents too. So they had a little summary about what they would commit to. So that was part of the conversation. So, you know, so that's Ooh. part of our journey and story too. And um, so just to check, you didn't ask the parents if they wanted streaming, you told them 
that you made a plan to change it? Uh, yes, and I think it started with our board of trustees that yep. made a commitment that this is what's yep. happening and this is our reason why, so we really tried to... But we've had lots mm. of parent mm. utter of feedback yep. around personalised learning and <coughs> meeting the needs. I also think there's a point where as leadership, you have to be brave enough to challenge the moral imperative. You have to challenge the inequity and you have to challenge the social structures and what it feels like potentially to be on the receiving end of it and by God if you know white people don't know what it's like to be on the receiving end of it but women know what it's like to be on the receiving end of it from patriarchy mm -hmm. and what it looks like and how the wagons circle mm -hmm. you know and that's the thing I'd you know the data is really good but if people don't want to change because it preserves their power mm -hmm. in society they'll just ignore the data mm -hmm. so that moral challenge is really important mm -hmm. Gosh, it's great hearing you talk Sorry. about it. Sorry. Yeah, it's great. We'll get off that I remember when Kristen, Kristen yeah. when she started here and her opening speech in the hall to all the girls was all about the going back to the founding mm. principle and, and her desire to change, change society. So well, and a lot about school would have been about colonisation because that's how you know, it came out at Canterbury University. But the two key conversations were you know, access to education for girls, but also going back to the streaming, I went delve back through some of the early literature and the writings of the founding women. They had a massive conversation with the head of the U university college, which was Canterbury University. Was this place to be just about academic achievement or was it to be about the holistic development of the person? Their decision when they founded the school was that it was about the holistic development and we had gone a long way away from that. So it's taken us back, back to some of the founding purposes. So, Vicky and Jeremy, mm -hmm. um, what's yeah. it been like? Do, Is it the real engine yeah. room of change? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm in the very fortunate position. I, I started teaching at Te Kura Ohini Wilder as a baby teacher. So before Christine's time, before Sonia's time. And when Christine arrived and all of this started, I just went, Finally, like finally we can go back to why we became teachers and you know finally we can start to discover what it means to teach a whole person and have students that care about people other than themselves because that's really what matters to me and when you get into a situation where uh, you're lining up students looking at our treaty um, those two things don't didn't marry up you know that we couldn't have our students continue to um, move through our school and exit CGHS and believe that um, kind of their well-being uh, was the most important thing uh, and that's really when I met Christine because <laughs> that's what I truly believe in and so when we established our values it was just easy you know and I was um, fortunate enough to be part of the education brief um, writing process and I was fortunate enough to be part of the innovation team um, I was fortunate enough to be part of the team that established the documentation that Sonia is um, referring to. Fortunate enough to be part of the literacy journey at our school. And so um, for me, it's been a no-brainer. But on the flip side to that, um, as you say, the engine room. So it's one thing to believe in the why, it's another thing to be implementing the how. And so that is something that Jeremy and I have been. Um, working on really, really, um, some really great mahi over the last two years around the how do we make this work in our school um, day to day. So, so I think yeah. we'd, get, we'd love to get yeah, specific yeah, about yeah. that now. Would that okay. be, could yeah, you two yeah. jam off each other and tell us totally. both the things that are working and some of the yeah. things that are still work on? Yeah, yeah so um, a bit from, um, yeah, from the a maths teacher's perspective, so I see a lot of what goes on across the other junior maths classrooms as well and hear a lot as well. So um, it's very, I think it's still very early days to be honest mm -hmm. for us um, because um, for a whole bunch of reasons. I think, um, yeah, like like Vicky's saying the how, is, um, it take, takes a while for all the teachers to fully um, start to think about different ways of doing things and I think we're excited too, but we've also been held back a little bit by all the stuff around COVID, and it's been like musical chairs with kids coming in and out of class, which you've all probably had um, in your classroom. So that's made it a lot harder because there's some really cool stuff I'm keen to try and have you doing a bit of, but then when when you've still got um, timelines and so on, and you've got kids away a lot, it, it, you end up you naturally withdraw back to just curriculum coverage, 
uh, which is not what the it's not the co-power of us. It's not all about um, just ramming knowledge into students' brains, but you end up starting to feel that pressure yeah. as a teacher, I think. And so, if I'm honest, um, I think um, I, I know myself have probably taken a step backward just because of that, and I'm quite excited about how. Uh, the opportunities now as things hopefully settle down a wee bit um, so you don't have that pressure of thinking oh this this person's missed that um, that particular concept so they're not going to understand this one and all that kind of stuff mm. um, and, and I think um, mixed stability groupings are really key um, especially early in the year and early in year 9 as well for, for our students so that you don't get these little cliques that form in the class because what, what happens if you don't do anything about it if you just try and teach a traditional way then you end up with, you know, the, the classes might not be streamed, but within your class, yeah. it'll just stream itself into little groups, and it's, and you end up with the same thing again. And it's almost worse in some ways if it's not managed well, because then the group that feels dumb, um, or groups that feel dumb, have that, that rubbed in their faces all, all the time. So it's really the teacher's job um, to actually help create the culture within a particular class early on. Um, because our classes are not streamed, they, they go around together in their ACL group, which is like their form class, for their core subjects. So that class culture is so important early on and I think developing those um, manaki tanga and whanangama tanga within the class um, so that students, for example, if a student comes in who um, is, is, is strong at maths um, and their parents want them to be pushed and extended but get them to actually think about um, other students that don't find it so easy too and actually um, sort of touching on that whole reciprocal teaching idea. Um, so I. I think it's still, we're still early days, I'm learning a lot all the time, even though I've taught mixed ability before this, um, but I think we can, I think we can still do it a lot better, and I'm quite excited about trying mm -hmm. different things, because the, the, it's huge, it's hugely empowering, I think, for students to be all mixing together, and it gives students a pathway to, uh, well it opens up more pathways, doesn't it, like say a student comes in, they feel behind the eight ball in English, um, in reading and writing, but they're in the same class with people that are quite strong at it. Mixing with them, having high expectations um, set, then it, it actually provides that pathway for them to end up having success, right? And it's the same in maths and, and, and so on, same with, with anything. So I think it's hugely, it's hugely empowering. And it's just helping those students who are the privileged ones in the subject to actually look at it from other people's perspective. Um, and that's that mindset. Yeah. So I think we've got we've still got a long way to go at ground level, but mm -hmm. the chalk face. But um, but it's definitely an exciting mm -hmm. journey. Yes. That makes any sense? Yeah, it does make a lot of sense <laughs> yeah. to me. Yeah. So and uh, it's a an great point about the subtle streaming within a class. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, because that naturally can happens. happen real quick, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that could be worse, right? Because you every day rubbing your face kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got a class at the moment where that. But I've inherited them because they were together in year nine, and, and that had happened. And Vicky, Vicky, and I both teach this class, mm. and um, they, that, that had happened. Um, and it's actually starting to get a bit better now. Um, and I don't know. I think we've we've had a few meetings as staff. have been quite intentional about it. Um, but I feel I don't know if you feel like the cultures. Mm. Yeah, it's just. Um, uh, I taught them. I asked to have them for a second year running. So well, I had them last year, and I had them this year, which has actually been the best possible outcome yeah. because the relationship that they have with them is different to the relationship the teachers have with them who have just entered this year yeah. with yeah. them as year 10 so yeah. yeah they've been my kind of babies from the start whereas others have entered their journey yeah. at year 10 yeah yeah, yeah but they they formed a little place yes they certainly had yeah. there was a lot of yeah it was essentially what you're just saying um but um there's starting to be a little bit of that breaking down which is cool i think but i think yeah, it's, it's def that's one of the challenges of it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And you're seeing the big benefit though is the uh, open horizon. That's well, right. Rather that's than saying, I'm in this and I'm going to stay here. Yeah. It's saying, I'm here, I might not be very good at this, but I can. Yeah, I totally. Can open horizon's a good word. I mean, I remember myself when I was in year 10, and um, I was in maths, uh, and I was sitting beside someone, a friend of mine, who would have been, because like, they were slightly streamed, but not, I think there was one. Uh, class that was streamed overall, but um, this guy would have been streamed if it was maths. He wouldn't have been in the same class as me because at that stage I wasn't. I was a late developer of maths myself, and, and he, um, <laughs> he um, it. actually clicked for me that year. I always tell my students the story at the start of the year, and um, and one of the reasons was I was sitting beside this guy who found it quite easy, and it, so I just started thinking, well, well, if he can do it, why can't I? Mm. We wouldn't have been in the same class if it had been yeah, yeah. heavily streamed. So. And now you're a maths So I wouldn't be a maths teacher. <laughs> <laughs> now you're a genius. Now you're a genius. Of course. <laughs>
And what's, what's it like in your English class? You know, what are some of the dynamics that you have Yeah, to yeah, no, I just wanted to mention as well that one of the key things that has, we've got going on in our school is what we call the junior hold squad. So um, when our holders meet, our junior heads of learning areas meet at the same time. And as a result of that, all of our junior hods, social sciences, particularly social studies, science, maths, English, and then a scattering of people from other departments, are all in the same place at the same time, talking about the same things that we're all kind of um, working through. And it's meant more than anything that we've formed really good relationships. And so um, I'm able to interact with Jeremy in a way that I wouldn't have been able to do had we not have had our little squad. So it's just that's just a side note for how it can work. If you're, you're, this starts in the junior school, and I'm a great believer that the best work happens in the junior school. So no offence to you know, <laughs> NCA, <laughs> but by then it's done. You know, your work is done. It all starts in year nine, and so yeah, that really um, matters to me. To answer your question, Chris, um, I was thinking before when we were talking about the literacy, <clears throat> and I wanted to say it, and I thought oh, I'll just wait till I get up here. Um, with the taking students out for help with literacy. But actually, the real question is, aren't we all teachers of literacy? So we sh why do we need to remove students from a classroom when actually it's everybody's responsibility to be the teachers of literacy? And so there's no reason why we should be taking students out because in PE, in health, in maths, and science, and everywhere you go across the school, literacy is at the foundation of the learning. And so as... Um, the literacy coordinator here, that's what I'm working on at the moment, is the idea that the director around the co-requisite was never that it was the English department's responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility. Kaiako, Fano, Akonga, like leadership team within a school. And so um, that's really the big question, is if you've got teachers saying to you, we've got students within our kura who need literacy support, you ask them, what are they doing about that? You know, what is their role as literacy teachers? So that kind of just, not answers, but that yeah. sort of addresses that idea that what do we do with students that are struggling on, in the yeah. literacy yeah. realm? Like, that's mm. for everyone. Cool. So um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so in our English space, um, I think the biggest, it's not, it's not really been a learning moment for me necessarily, but for us it's about relationships. It always is, isn't it? About student-teacher relationships. Um, so much more of what we do is around um, conferencing with students one-on-one. -on -one. So, for example, I've got my Year 10 class, we're working through the film Little Woman. Um, and so Year 9 class, we're working through the film. And we're, I'm modelling a scene analysis and then um, we do that together and then for one, two lessons they are actually selecting their own scene from Little Woman and they are analysing their scene. I'm dipping in and out of their um, documents on Google Classroom. I'm bringing students up to the front. I'm sitting with small groups. I'm asking whether there are exp uh, with people who want to be part of like a group that talks about lighting, for example, or a group that talks about camera work. And we've got clusters. We've got one-on-one, -on -one, I'm dipping in and out, I'm making comments on documents, I'm seeing students' faces light up when they realise that I'm in there <laughs> making a particular comment about something particular that they're doing. And that's happening while the class have got their headphones on in most cases because they're doing scene analysis or they're doing it in a small group. And I feel like um, options and choice yeah. are really what's the drive, what yeah. will engage the students. That, yeah. you know, in year 10 they're doing an interview process where they choose somebody in the community um, who links to the theme of aiming high, and I've been working through um, Māori and Pacifica role models, so working the, the stories of um, people in Aotearoa, and then they choose somebody that they um, that they think kind of reflects their values, and they choose their own person to interview, they choose the questions that they ask, they choose the process of the interview, they choose the logistics of how it happens, and all of a sudden there's the engagement level just rises, and I mean I've always been uh, a believer in the high expectations. It's just um, I'm uh, teaching or studying um, Fiti Hiriaka's bugs in my year 13 class, and you know, it just talks about the idea that teachers are, you know, we're, we're not setting the bar, we're just showing them how to kind of, you know, exceed it, and it's really what it's about, um, particularly around the options. We did make really, um, uh, really big changes in our English program though, particularly around our assessment, because again, another question was around. Um, the literacy, removing students for literacy, and my big question was, well, what does the success criteria look like? If people aren't reaching where you want them to be, there's something wrong with what you're asking them to do. And so what we um, have done is we've broken our English assessment, so they're obviously at the levels, but instead of giving students one grade for an assessment, so 
let's just say they're responding to a text like a film or they're doing their oral presentation or they're doing their um, creative writing instead of getting one grade they get four grades so they get a grade for purpose and audience a grade for ideas a grade for language and a grade for structure and so students are then able to go well actually um, I'm really great when it comes to ideas, but unfortunately my punctuation was what kind of, you know, was a drawback. Whereas in the old days we would say, you are not achieved because your punctuation reflects that you don't meet, the, you know. Um, exactly. And so it's changed the culture in the room around when you give back assessments. Because a student goes, well, what did you get? And the other student goes, well, what do you mean? For purpose and audience, for structure, for language, or for ideas? And then all of a sudden there's no competition, it's just actually... How are we going to use these grades to make goals, to, mm. to set goals, mm. to achieve? And then the parents have been really, like Fano, have been really um, positive around that change mm. with the, because all of a sudden we're able to talk to them in a really specific, individualised way about where their student is at, um, as opposed to just saying um, student X mm. received not achieved for writing. Yeah. Whereas that helps no one. Yeah. Mm. Um, so a lot of people ask the question, like, if you don't have streaming, how do you deal with a multi-level class, you know, or multi-curriculum levels in the yeah. class? Sounds like yeah. your answer is mm. you, you've got a lot of student-centred learning going on and you're differentiating by becoming the coach. Yeah, you know, kind yeah, of working absolutely. Their way through the material. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because there's a lot of work for the teacher. Oh, abs setting up a lot. absolutely. And we had a... Um, Different, well, we called it differentiation group in the first year where we met on a regular basis and talked through these strategies. And part of my role was tracking of students. Like, how do we actually get to a stage where we've got um, accurate tracking of students at year nine and year 10? And so we ended up uh, having like an ES still as sort of a starting, starting point only. And then we gave a diagnostic piece of writing. Um, no grade given to the student, which I think is a really important part of this. We never give a grade for the first piece of writing that we give back to students, but just a comment. Uh, we grade and keep the grade, teachers will keep the grades as sort of just an indication of you know, things that we need to work through. But the main point of the um, tracking spreadsheet was that when we realised that we had some students who might need some support or might need a different way of doing things, um, we met as a team, like learning enhancement, myself, um, a whole range of people in a room, and one by one we went through the students and we made sure that actually there was something available to that mm. student. Like, were they in ESOL, were they having learning enhancement support? Um, did the teacher need to be, was it, were they being offered, when I say nothing, did we need to make sure the teacher knew that they weren't in any of those, um, those avenues and so therefore the lists were given to teachers and they needed to own um, the fact that there were students in their past who perhaps weren't, um, you know, at the, at the same level and yeah. It's great to get that level of detail of what goes on in the classroom because there's a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely.